Hey, good morning, good afternoon. As a co-director of the, of the Terrorism Transnational and, and Corruption Center um, and Titles and Trade Institute with Dr. Luis Shelley, the founder of TRAC, who will shortly provide some opening remarks. It is a pleasure to moderate today's uh, webinar uh, that focuses on four illicit trade hotspots, Dubai, UAE, Central America, the Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay tripolar area, and Ukraine with touch points with Eastern Europe, as well as different types of cross-border illicit trades, including natural resources, counterfeits, excise goods, drugs, arms, and human trafficking. And of course, related corruption and crime convergence issues. We are honored to have a very distinguished panel of speakers for the private sector and iconic brands to join us and share their insights and perspective, including industry best practices and solutions to combat illicit trade at critical illicit trafficking points across global security landscapes and odds. In understanding some preliminary research uh, and undertaking some of the preliminary research, examining these four hubs in greater detail, we are seeing some interesting interconnections across illicit markets internationally and the destabilizing effects that they have across other trade hubs, supply chains, free trade zones, and safe havens for an array of bad actors and threat networks and their enablers. More globally, these hubs also serve as threat multipliers, as crime, as criminal entrepreneurs, counterfeiters, money launderers, and complicit corrupt officials and the facilitators are engaged in, in the lucrative multi-billion dollar criminalized economy. In fact, the United Nations has estimated that the dirty money laundered annually from such criminal activities constitutes up to 5% of global GDP or about 4.5 trillion in 2021. Now, before I formally introduce our speakers, Jerry Cook from Haynes Brand, Monica Ramirez from AB InBev, and Adrian Sheik, let me first ask Dr. Louise Shelley to share her insights and perspectives on today's topics. As mentioned earlier, Dr. Shelley is the founder and director of Trek and the Omer Nancy Hurst Endowed Chair and the University Professor at George Mason University, Dr. Shelley. Well, we're delighted to see so many of you online. And looking through the list of participants, we see that we have a really international audience with enormous knowledge. One of the things that is different about TRAC is our eagerness to work with the business community. Um, because without getting data, without getting insights from the business community, one cannot really understand how illicit trade operates because it's business that carries on trade. And illicit trade is combated by government, but without data insights, we are doing this um, blind. And one of the things that we pride ourselves on at TRAC is our ability to use innovative data techniques to work in multiple languages, multiple cultures of the world, and to establish partnerships with scholars, with government, with, with companies that can help us understand the complexities of these problems. So while many people talk about addressing illicit trade through a whole of government approach, we believe in involving a whole of society. And that also involves journalists who also have, have insights. So this is part of what we are most interested in, in sharing with you today is our unique perspective and the people that that will collaborate with us. And for many of you who don't know, we've had support from the National Science Foundation to work on illicit trade and counterfeits. And together with um, Leila Hashemi, who is on this, on this call and has helped contact many of you, um, we work together with 3M, I, I would say, a marriage made in heaven put together by the government and us with 3M 
and they provided us with data. And as a result of the data analytics that our team did, we helped lead to the confiscation of 60 million counterfeit masks worldwide and the takedown of over between 50 and 60,000 online postings and social media um, involved in this illicit trade. So one of our key interests and qualities is also how we can use data smartly and provide analysis that is meaningful and helps us focus because there is so much international trade. People talk about this problem as looking for a needle in a haystack, but we have to find ways to amplify that needle so it isn't so small and becomes like a wedge that can get us into the problem. So with that, I will um, cease my opening remarks and turn it over to the enormous expertise that we have in this panel today who are working in different sectors of the economy and are trying to combat illicit trade in free trade zones, in ports, in, in the maritime context, and in many others. And so I think you're going to have a very interesting day today in looking at the diverse ways that corporate leaders address this problem. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Shelley. <clears throat> thank you for the emphasis on the whole of society approach and how it, it takes um, a network to fight networks, including working not only with governments, but the private sector, civil society, academia, um, and develop, in developing public private partnerships. Our first speaker is Jerry Cook, um, who is the Vice President of Government and Trade Relations with Haynes Brand Inc. Haynes Brand leading brands include Haynes, Haynes Herway, Bali Champions, Bonds, and Gear for Sport, and many others, with sales of over $7 billion annually. Jerry joined Haynes Brand, uh, Haynes Brand in 1987 and managed various engineering functions and strategic planning roles at Haynes. Jerry? So, thank you, David, and thank you, Dr. Shelley, and thank uh, everyone for joining today. I appreciate your interest in this. It's, I think Dr. Shelley kind of wrapped it up with a, a very key statement. It takes the whole of society to address this because it's affecting the whole of society and uh, and it it's it's quite a challenge the the challenges that we are facing really and specifically in latin america is it always always feel a little bit awkward trying to broad stroke over a, a whole region of the world but but i think it's it's fairly obvious when you're dealing in latin america there's there's different heat maps depending on how you look at illicit trade but one thing's for sure is it's there, it's dominant, and it's growing. And, and part of it is, that we're facing is the challenges of, of how you integrate global economies and how they work together, sometimes facilitate illicit trade, and sometimes illicit trade is able to mimic and look like legitimate trade and stay below the radar. But at the end of it, it's all tied to one event, and that is the conversion of illicit trade to money. Um, because if, if they were not able to profit from it, they certainly would not be. So that's at the end of the day, it's always going to be about the money. So what do we run into? Well, there's I would say there's probably five key areas that we we constantly are stumbling and being challenged uh, that we run into. The first is illegal drugs, hands down the most lucrative part of the illicit trade, and it's rampant in every country, including the United States, either as a producer, shipper, a consumer, you know, we can call it last mile, last neighborhood, last street, last person, or the initiator or the provider of chemicals. But it is a, a very important supply chain that is a very lucrative supply chain, very robust and, and very successful. And it weakens pretty much all assets of society today. 
um, from very high level corruption to local law enforcement to internal security for companies. And it, it is quite a challenge to manage that. It is estimated that the illegal drug trade in Latin America alone is worth annually over $150 billion. That when you put up against the size of Fortune 500 companies, dwarfs quite a few of them, and, uh, and it provides a lot of cash for the influence they need. The second area is in counterfeits, and this goes right at brands' reputation, their credibility, um, the value to the shareholder, and, and as in the United States, an increasing number of people are going to rely on 401ks. So in many ways, that also goes to the, the credibility and potentially the taking of value down of people at home and their pensions and their 401k investments because the WCO estimates that somewhere between 5 and 7% of all global consumer trade is counterfeit trade moving along. And the, and the reason for counterfeits is obvious. It, it's, it is to get something that is perceived to be equal to at a significant discount without paying the copyright on the trademark. But in many cases, apart from just wearing apparel, you're talking about the counterfeiting of, of computer chips, the counterfeiting of food, the counterfeiting of critical nuts and bolts for airplanes that can undermine and create major safety issues. And at the time you know, when the counterfeits produced, in many cases, the legitimate company is, is the one that's left in the marketplace to clean up the damage uh, of both the counterfeit and the the, the damage that a fake does to the individual. The other one that you run into is, is also the things cigarette industry has this quite a bit, but it's really cigarette vaping and alcohol. These, these immediate consumables that have high excise taxes on it, it creates shadow markets, it creates alternative shipping arrangements and decorations, and they're largely tax avoidance schemes that are going on that become very profitable, and they largely don't stay in that, they, they expand out. So, uh, but they're very effective in immediate cash flow, and they get you to a retail point, to the point of sale. And that's the part that when we walk away from today is, if you can remember one thing, illicit, has to get to the point of sale. It has to get to the point of conversion where it's taking either the illegal, the counterfeit, the, the non-tax entity, and it's got to convert it to the point of sale, the cash. And then it's got to move the cash, the money back. And if you think about moving $150 billion in illegal, that, you know, that's a lot of tractor trailers of money that doesn't go as a tractor trailer of money. So it's moving itself through fake enterprises, fake uh, financial transactions, and through uh, different government entities in the process. The other one, which is very scary and very dangerous, is cargo thefts. They still occur. They happen throughout uh, the ocean, the maritime, by land, sometimes by air at airports. These sometimes can be pretty violent. They are targeted, and usually they rely on the better data they can extract from transportation and company systems, the, uh, the better they can target and go after the products and pull those. And then you've got the, the supporting supply chains that allow them to be moved and transloaded and yet the most dangerous that you're now seeing every night on TV and every morning is the amount of human trafficking in Latin America, probably the most grotesque and the scariest form because in modern day time, there is absolutely zero tolerance for it. But yet we watch it every day in the news and governments are participating in it. There's a lot of arguments why mass itself and human kindness, perhaps, but it's not. It is the the clearly the worst form of illicit trade, and it it is the cheapening of life in a way 
and it violates every standard, every code of ethics that anyone lives by, any government's declared and any company. And yet uh, the willingness to stop it seems uh, very parched at this point. There's a lot of arguments for why this is happening. In many ways, you can argue that Latin America has been faced with a series of of political challenges. And I'd say the good news is if you look broadly, the number of democracies that exist in Latin America is, a, is certainly a reflection of each country wanting to set its own course and its own independence, but it needs to work in an integrated fashion with its neighbors to stop it. It's easy to step back and accuse that the U.S. has made it more difficult uh, by trying to carry forward into the 21st century a Monroe-type doctrine, which has alienated certain countries' willingness to participate. But I think at the end of the day, we have to realize that the real alienator is the is the need for money, and it is the it is the greed side of life that drives this. And so, building out those supplier relationships to ensure you know who you're doing business with. David's had pretty good hand. I'm sure Dr. Shelley spends a lot of time with the data mining, but grasping that part of it. And it then ties into the last piece, and, and that is the illicit trade of moving arms and weapons. We see that throughout uh, Latin America. You can see it certainly South the United States, very clearly in Mexico. From the 1970s forward, there's a couple of interesting studies that talk about when you combine the illicit trade of drugs, people, and money uh, with weapons that you're looking at over 70,000 people have probably died in that, in that terrible kind of paradigm that's been laid out and it amplifies itself. And just kind of in closing, I think that the United States, and it's spent a lot of time, whether through the congressional resource or groups like this, looking at it, but we're losing the battle. The, 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 the amount and the sheer volume of illicit trade is not backing down, and it's getting bolder. It's, it's no longer just a border issue. It's all the way into the center of every state. In many cases, almost every city in the United States and every city and state in Latin America. And I think collectively, we are going to have to find either bolder ways to counter that or more effective ways to devalue that. Because if, if we don't, the illicit trade itself, and we've seen it play itself out, and Haiti's a good example, that the ability of illicit trade creates illicit operations and, and it creates cartels and gangs that ultimately control large swaths of populations. And that includes maritime, land, sea, and air. And uh, I think it's incumbent upon us today to work closely together to, uh, to, to not let that be our future. And David, with that, I'll, I'll pause there and and turn it back over. Hey, thank you very much, Jerry. And, and I do want to get back to, um, during the Q&A to some of the great points that you made. I, I do agree that we are losing the battle um, and the, real, the realities and challenges that you point out only really magnify you know, some of the challenges and, and why it is important that we galvanize uh, through collective action to, to, to really address um, these, these threats more holistically. Um, our next speaker um, is Monica Ramirez Gill, who is the Global Director uh, for Regulatory and Public Policy um, and Corporate Affairs at AB InBev. In Heiser Bush, InBev is the world's largest brewer and the maker of more than 500 brands, sold in over 100 countries, including Budweiser, Bud Light, Corona, Stella, Etois, bags, and many others, with global revenue at an estimated $50 billion in 2022. Monica will be um, presenting on illicit alcohol and its market challenges. Monica. Thank you, David. Thank you for the invitation and thank you, Dr. Shelley. I'm really happy to be here sharing this, uh, this really interesting topic with everybody. Um, if we go to the next one, 
I would like to share with you uh, the world of illicit trade from the alcohol beverages point of view. Important thing to mention here that this applies to any sector. So, you know, the principles that I'm going to share with you, it could be applicable to any sector which is uh, susceptible to, to illicit trade. So in the case of alcoholic beverages, what we did, and we've been working with uh, illicit uh, trade on alcoholic beverages, uh, the brewing sector, which uh, uh, beer is not the problem, but it affects our industry in a negative way. So we have been, been studying the size, the shape, the drivers of illicit alcohol. Um, for more than 15 years now. And uh, so the first thing that we had uh, to have clear is what are we talking about? Then saying, you know, then to have a good understanding of the size and shape. And then, okay, what are we going to do about this problem? So if we go to the next one, next is try to understand the definitions and try to understand with our key stakeholders, meaning the consumers, meaning the government, meaning our peers, etc. What is it uh, that we're talking about when we talk about illicit alcohol? And this happens in many industries. Uh, sometimes it is ignored. And we have a conversation, for example, regarding uh, regulations or regarding uh, people consuming, uh, you know, uh, or the labeling of the products of just the recorded part, just the green part. And then the big elephant in the room is, uh, is ignored. I was uh, a couple of weeks ago in Zambia, uh, where the level of illicit alcohol is 69%. So, well, you know, we talk a lot about the, the 31%, which is the rest of the illicit part, but not the illicit part. So we want to raise awareness of these big elephants in the room and find ways, you know, from the private sector, uh, you know, making good partnerships with, uh, with the public sector to, to try to close uh, the gap between the price of illicit and illicit, which is exactly in the case of alcohol, the biggest driver is the price gap. Next. So trying to define the different uh, shapes of illicit alcohol, we see contraband, uh, we see uh, contraband of the, final, uh, of the final product, let's say, for example, a product that is uh, uh, smuggled into a country without paying customs taxes, or uh, the contraband or smuggling of ethanol. And uh, this is really interesting, ethanol, uh, industrial ethanol that is meant for other uses that not human consumption is diverted into um, into the into the alcoholic beverages world, and this was uh, uh, this problem got uh, much uh, worse after COVID or during COVID because, of course, uh, all countries uh, relaxed the regulations about um, uh, about um, uh, robbing alcohol, uh, about uh, you know getting prepared for the COVID. Um, these ethanol imports were really relaxed, and we now see the consequences. All the countries have a lot of ethanol around and that has been sold as illicit alcohol. Counterfeit, no need to explain. We see a lot of counterfeit, a lot of uh, refill uh, bottles of very expensive uh, alcoholic beverages with really low quality alcoholic beverages. Also uh, bottles uh, full of ethanol with a little bit of uh, flavor and with a color that looks like wine. And it's a wine that has a level of alcohol of, uh, it can be very easily 30%. And it's regarded as, as alcohol, it's, set, it's sold as alcohol, of course, it's a counterfeit. Artisanal for trade, we see these a lot. I saw last, uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in Zambia, there is this beverage called Chibuko. So we have to, um, uh, we have to understand that uh, there are some traditional and artisanal um, uh, practices in many countries that is not illicit. The illicit part comes when these becomes for trade and it becomes really high, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in large quantities and it lacks all the sanitary, uh, you know, minimal uh, requisites for, for, for that, for being safe. And uh, we have saw, for example, in the case of, of uh, Dominican Republic during COVID, at some point in the first six months, we had more people dead of illicit alcohol, of a, of a substance, of a, uh, of a liquid called cleren, than of the people that was dead uh, due to COVID. So this is a bad, this is a, and this happened uh, in very similarly in the case of Mexico, in the case of India, South Africa, well, the country ran out of pineapples because everybody was, you know, fermenting their own moonshine and everything. So this artisanal, when it becomes straight, for trade, it is, it is bad news. Surrogate is alcohol that is not intended for human consumption. 
it's people drinking the colognes, uh, the mouthwash, etc. And tax leakage, um, we have engaged the government because this is very important, is um, very, in many countries, there's a very large pool of value for the government. Uh, just to give you an example, in the case of, uh, of Zambia, that we had a conversation with the government just for uh, the smuggling um, tax uh, revenue that is lost and for the excise taxes that are lost, there is a pool of value of more than $150 million just for a small country like Zambia per year. So that's very attractive also for the government to, to, to fix this problem. Next. Size and shape. And uh, in general terms, although, you know, in, in a global level, one out of four bottles that people drink in the world is illicit. And meaning that, so that's 25% of the alcohol around the world on average is illicit. Of course, if we look into Africa, it's nearly 50% of the, of, the, of, the, of the alcohol is illicit. And uh, uh, here in the US, of course, it's less than 2%. On average, 25 in volume terms. And in value, what is really interesting here is that, uh, you know, uh, in some of these cases, it is not uh, easy to calculate the value because we're comparing, for example, a bottle of whiskey, uh, you know, blue label at full value or the one that is like, you know, the, the, the one that is not full value. So there, uh, you know, it can be much lower the size of the illicit market, uh, taking into account that that bottle is sold uh, very cheaply. Important also the fiscal loss. So um, in this one, the big message here is and, and for alcoholic beverages, but for any for the, for any other industry, is very important to see you know what is the size, what is the shape, what are the drivers, to understand what is what are the dynamics of the market before doing uh, you know having any decisions. And and of course, it's not easy to measure uh, an illicit market. It is very difficult to measure an illicit market. Of course, far more difficult to measure an illicit. But uh, you know as much as possible. We have, uh, we have uh, Euromonitor International that has supported us for many years, uh, more than 50 something studies uh, on illicit. And, uh, and there's already uh, a methodology that it has been already created. We can share with you this information. And of course, the, the, all this information is public for you to take a look and, and, and dig in if you're interested also in the methodology of quantification of illicit trade. Next. Size and shape. Very important on this is that we have to understand that this is a multi, this is an international problem. So, for example, if we just analyze this as a map of of, uh, of uh, Africa, if we just analyze any country, let's say South Africa, if we ignore what are the forces of the market, you know, regarding um, regarding importation or you know smuggling of ethanol, and then uh, you know the the uh, the other beverages that South Africa is is uh, producing in South Africa and that have been exported legally and illegally. Uh, we don't understand. So it is very important to take a, a very high level view to understand the drivers and not to analyze just one country. Next. Same in the case of Latin America. For example, we have analyzed Panama as an important hub where we see that a lot of uh, of illicit trade takes place, but uh, then again, a lot of illicit trade, uh, illicit trade takes place. And uh, and analyzing, uh, you know, the free trade zone um, in Panama, but also there's another free trade zone in Peru, which is called Tacna. We see uh, flows of uh, flows of ethanol and uh, and finished product, uh, you know, throughout these countries. And and again, it's really uh, important to understand which are the hubs and which are the drivers. Uh, you know, of these, of these illicit trade in the different countries. Next. Wait forward, and this is very important. So I mentioned before, it is critical to understand the size, the shape, the drivers, to get knowledge and insight. Uh, the other one is raise awareness of this big elephant in the room. We have worked at OECD level with the World Health Organization. And, uh, you know, in raising awareness of recognizing the problem, this is a health problem. This is a people, if they drink uh, a counterfeited beverage, they die. Like, uh, or the, in, the, in the best of the cases, uh, if, the, if the beverage has uh, methanol, uh, you know, people get blind. And this happens in many countries around the world. So, so this, is a, this is a critical problem that is not just for the industry, but for, for the community. We have been working in many countries to raise awareness of this and to raise awareness with the consumers 
um, you know, of the of the dangers of, of illicit alcohol. The other one that, it, that we see the very that is very important is COVID-19 lessons. We have in a couple of years a compressed um, a compressed experience of how uh, the, um, really tight regulations and really tight control. In some countries, we had to close our production plants. We had to close, you know, the bars, the mom and pop stores, uh, the restaurants, etc. We all have lived through through what happened through COVID. Uh, but um, but the illicit players of the market, they didn't rest and they didn't have any restrictions. So in many countries where we have been making some advancements in, you know, controlling illicit trade and closing that price gap, again, you know, COVID messed up the whole thing again. And, uh, and uh, it was an amazing opportunity for illicit players to gain uh, a lot of ground. We have a lot of lessons uh, learned from, 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 from COVID that can be applied in uh, in, in many sectors and for future, um, you know, regulatory framework, um, not just of alcoholic beverages, but of any other product that is excisable or that is controlled in some way. Next. So, and the most important uh, message here is that we need to find a solution according to the problem. So what we've seen in the past in many countries is that the government, they are aware of, of what is the problem, and then they have a solution which doesn't have anything to do with the problem. So, for example, if we're talking about counterfeit, uh, you know, it's very easy to see, okay, uh, let's check all ethanol regulation and then the control. Uh, we, have a, we have one example in Colombia. You see the picture in the middle, the policeman there, uh, right next to him is a little lab where it's very easy to, you know, like a, like a COVID test. Uh, just a little bit like a, like a pregnancy test, like you know, you 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 dip into the uh, into the in this case ethanol, and you see it is denatured or not. If the you know ethanol is denatured, uh, it's not meant for human consumption. If it is if it is not denatured, then it has to you know to to be controlled in the borders and throughout uh, the final you know throughout uh, uh, the whole value chain. So, so this is a very low hanging, the very easy to implement, low hanging fruit regulation that can be applied in any country. Most developed countries have this in place, but most developing countries, they don't have it. So it is a, it is a good start. Smuggling, super easy, customs uh, targeted interventions. We don't need to have, for example, we see the far right picture is fiscal marking. This is marking each and every bottle of can. So this is the classic example or for example, we have um, a country like Dominican Republic. What is the problem of illicit alcohol in Dominican Republic? They have two problems. One, counterfeited spirits, and the other one, smuggling. So, you know, uh, if, if, they, if, if the government um, has a solution to the problem of smuggling, internally, nothing is gonna happen to the, to the products that are coming. So, you know, if there is no border control, uh, that is the easiest one. You know, we go upstream and say, okay, for smuggling is customs uh, control. Then once the product is already um, controlled at the border, once it gets into the country, there's no problem right now. Uh, the case of, uh, of, of the fiscal marking is, is having, um, let's say, for example, I break my arm and I have an appendix operation. Like, you know, I have a completely, uh, completely, uh, non-related solution to the problem that I have. And this is critical. And this has been the case in some countries where governments have been misguided into solutions that they don't match with the problem. Um, for example, for artisanal for trade, support the, the, the local artisanal producers, uh, encourage uh, formalization. Illicit trade has to do a lot with uh, development, developing in the country and development. So we have to deal a lot with uh, formalization and uh, and give the uh, uh, you know to the to the artisanal producers uh, a good framework uh, to support uh, their production and to get out of these illicit in and in some cases informal not illicit uh, background in which they operate and of course for tax leakage we have an amazing opportunity with technology we have helped in some countries to introduce. Uh, for example, electronic invoicing systems, not just for alcoholic beverages, but for, whole, for the whole country. We have been the guinea pigs in many countries and, and, and technology has uh, permitted uh, governments to, to, um, to be very active in, um, 
in um, in enforcement, and it has uh, you know provided not just control on illicit, but control uh, you know um, an important increase in fiscal revenue for for the country. So these are the solutions according to the problem. Next. Just to finalize, to end this, 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 this initial part, I would like to share with you, um, this is 1933, 90 years ago, a prohibition was lifted here in the US. So after 13 years of prohibition with alcohol was illicit, then we had 100% of illicit market here in the US. Now back to 2023 or starting 2023, uh, we see that the, 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 the level of illicit alcohol right now in the US uh, is less than 2%. What did the US make uh, to make, you know, from 102 uh, to from 100 to 2%? And then if we go to the next slide, then we are on average 25% right now in 2023. And, uh, and what is the, what is it that we have to do to get to a much lower uh, level, you know, let's say in five, in 10, in 15 years, and we've seen, I gave you the example of Zambia, 69%. We have uh, the case of Dominican Republic, almost one third of the market is illicit. Uh, countries like India, we, we even have prohibition in some states in India, which is 100% similar to the US. So the lesson here is, okay, now we have the numbers, we have the policies in place, we have the possibility of, of, of uh, getting and mobilizing the private sector with the public sector, uh, sitting in tables, so working together, how, do, how fast do we want to reduce this? And of course, hopefully it's not gonna be the 90 years of the US, it's gonna be much faster, uh, take advantage of technology and, and of course of the willingness of, of the private sector to contribute, uh, you know, reducing illicit trade. That's it for me. Thank you, Monica. You know, it's very concerning actually when you point out that one of four bottles of alcohol is illicit around the world, very, very concerning. And, um, great emphasis on the illicit, illicit uh, dynamics and what you call, you know, the elephant in the room uh, between legal commerce and, and dark commerce. And, and, you know, it's not only the tax leakage, as you point out, especially during economic recovery, but the, the public health and safety elements are, are, are even more critical these days. Thank you for sharing, like, your real um experiences in markets and the disconnect between finding solutions and addressing real challenges and hopefully we can have a discussion on how we can reduce it from 25 to a smaller percent globally so thank you for, for sharing those insights last thank you, but not least is adrian sheik who is a strategic market threat and intelligence researcher and risk mitigating mitigation professional who works across industries around the world he is a respected former UK law enforcement officer, including with the National Crime Agency and the Metropolitan Police. Adrian will focus on how civil illicit trades from wallets to websites. Adrian. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, so as David mentions, I have the benefit of looking at this particular problem from uh, both perspectives, uh, from the frustrations as a former law enforcement officer and also from the private sector, where um, obviously the public-private partnerships are absolutely key to tackling um, what we are currently seeing in the illicit markets uh, and, and simply not being able to uh, share information openly and easily and uh, often lack of understanding around um, what we can actually do. So I'm actually going to start with some with a uh, with a positive, or well, starts with a positive and ends up being a negative. But um, during my law enforcement career, I actually was part of Operation Pangea, which is the Interpol-led global um, operation targeting uh, illicit medicines and medical devices. It started in 2008, and it's still still going today. Um, it runs every single year, um, and this year, or for 2022, for example, um, you know, some of the positives to take out of that operation, although I'm no longer um, directly involved in that operation, um, you know, 4,000 web links and social media platforms uh, were investigated 
uh, 4,000 of those were shut down for illicit products. And this is illicit products from the medicine perspective. Um, the same thing can be translated into cigarettes, alcohol, and some of the other topics we've, we've already heard today. Uh, 3,000 packages, um, 280 postal hubs, airports, borders, and mail distribution, cargo mail centers, and we'll touch upon this a bit later on. And then 600 new investigations and 200 search warrants um, in, in the 2022 operation, which is all fantastic. It's a collaboration of nearly 90 law enforcement and agency um, parties around the globe all collaborating on, in one particular operation, sharing information between each other. And um, you know, you're able to do some kind of disruption uh, work. However, there are some negatives that come out of this. And um, as someone who was involved in the planning of this operation, certainly in, for the first five years, um, you know, things that we, we identified during that time was it's the same period every, every single year. And um, what we were starting to see from an intelligence perspective is the bad guys, the criminals, they, they very quickly caught on to this and they knew it was gonna be the same period every year. So in the month or two run up to the actual operation itself, you started to see the online chatters saying, oh, don't forget, it's Operation Pangea coming up soon. Don't forget to do this, don't forget to do that. So they actually shut down some of their operations during this period. Um, they also sacrificed, uh, you know, dead wood uh, within their organizations and their operations. So websites which they which they no longer use were no longer functional. They left up. Um, maybe there was a um, an affiliate who wasn't exactly doing exactly what they wanted it to do, so they would sacrifice an affiliate. Um, the Danish Medicines Agency. Um, in just in the last uh, operation, uh, pointed out that uh, it was the usual suspects that were identified. So then you start to question if it's the usual suspects and you already know it's the usual suspects, is this operation actually having any impact? Because we're seeing the same people year in, year out reappearing. Uh, between Pangea 2 and Pangea 5, uh, you know, we tackled and removed over 10,000 illicit websites, links, and social media posts. And this was per operation. I think the, the most we did was over 15,000. Yet the current numbers are sitting around three, 4,000. But the illicit farmer trade uh, across its broad description is only increasing, yet the numbers are decreasing in terms of the actual you know, disruption activity. Um, so the numbers are just not simply matching there. And then the final sort of negative to take away from this is that it's virtually the same illicit business model from 15 years ago. And this business model from the illicit crime perspective is still working today. And the key here is from their perspective, you don't fix what's not broken and clearly it's not broken because the same model um, is, is still in operation and still works to a certain perspective. So uh, next slide, please. So the biggest impact on uh, the illicit, certainly the illicit farmer trade um, due to the various different you know, smuggling routes and transportation routes uh, that are used to supply the illicit, illicit farmer products was actually the pandemic. Um, but the pandemic then spawned a new business opportunity. And this is where us as investigators, you know, law enforcement and so on, we are very, very, very slow to pivot and monitor these new, new, uh, this new activity. Um, so what we see on the left-hand side is a TikTok post where the seller is selling Xanax. Obviously, Xanax is a prescription-only medication. You can't sell it online. Certainly, won't be selling it on TikTok, breaching a whole load of laws and regulations worldwide. But um, and we and as part of Dr. Hashimi's work, uh, the same seller then pivoted straight into pandemic-based materials. In this case, it was uh, the 3M face mask, as Dr. Shelley mentioned um, during the introduction. So where they saw their business model being impacted by um, you know, the postal service being closed and you know, trade routes being disrupted, 
they pivoted very, very quickly into another illicit trade, uh, almost seamlessly. And then we saw um, the increase in uh, COVID-based uh, advertising and materials. Um, what you can see on the screen there now is, um, you know, a potential COVID-19 vaccine. And this actually came out a full eight months before a vaccine was available. Uh, but we saw the same actors um, moving from their illicit uh, pharmaceutical businesses into the illicit COVID business. And their high-tech uh, research facility was actually the address below in New Mexico. And that address below in New Mexico, which uh, I think we would all agree doesn't look very high tech, um, is actually the same address that's used to register a bunch of websites selling uh, prescription based medications. So again, they are simply just pivoting as quickly as possible. And the disruption mechanisms that we're putting in place are simply not able to move as fast or are willing to um, move into new areas without significant research and development. Another example that we can use here is, um, you know, with online money laundering, pig butchering, which is very big news at the moment. Um, really, we've only seen in the last couple of years, specialist um, legal uh, action uh, into reclaiming crypto funds and uh, money based upon these fraudulent activity. So the same would happen here with the illicit economy is that it really, it's really only been the last couple of years where we pivoted, been able to pivot into that. Bearing in mind that a lot of the crypto, certainly Bitcoin, for example, has been around since you know, 2010, 2009, 2010. That's almost a full 13 years behind where they've had chance to establish these businesses, establish the chance to establish their processes. And we're now playing playing catch up. Next one, please. So again, this is where wallets to websites um, sort of comes into uh, part of the research process. Um, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn and I know we have some law enforcement folks um, here today, but outdated methodology is one of our biggest um, hindrance. Uh, we will only look at one specific area, maybe two specific areas. And here I'm talking about the illicit online economy. I'm not talking about a physical um, search and seizure process. So here we will look to disrupt the um, online activity. So we will look purely at websites or social media posts. Or alternatively, if you're in the financial um, institutions, You'll be looking at the merchant activity. You'll be looking at how the money is being moved, how it's being transferred and funds. As we've already heard, uh, that's you know a billion dollar business. But what we very, very rarely do is look at how we can disrupt the bigger picture. So in this example here, um, so uh, for those not aware, cannabis is actually a legal is a legal substance in uh, Canada. Uh, it's been legal since 2018. And the assumption from the Canadian government uh, was that as soon as cannabis uh, was made legal, that the illicit market would go away. And the initial estimations were that cannabis was going to be an $8 billion a year business. Um, those estimations are now up into the 20 plus billion dollar business. The illicit market uh, was a three, $3.5 billion business. So now we're in 2023. And there has been almost zero activity on the illicit market in terms of enforcement action. So when you look at the research and you look at the online presence of these um, particular cannabis shops, 74% of the information currently, or the websites currently available are illicit. So by illicit, we mean they are not registered by any of the provincial uh, entities as a legally uh, entitled cannabis store to sell these products, 74%. Yet the marketing material and the information coming from the Canadian government is that the illicit market or the legal market has now overtaken the uh, illicit market. So again, the information being gathered simply does not make sense. 
So what we look, what we are looking at here is um, one particular payment um, address. Uh, a lot of the payments for the illicit cannabis market, and again, this is this translates easily into cigarettes, tobacco, alcohol, pharmaceuticals, and and, and so on. Um, is used by multiple different stores or multiple different vendors. Um, and through that payment uh, or pivoting off that payment option and looking at where else is it being used or where else are those payments being gathered, um, you can actually identify a much, much larger network. And we have some examples of that further on and do some much, much more aggressive disruption. When you think that Buying a website for your new illicit online business can be as cheap as 99 cents. It makes sense to bulk buy a hundred, a thousand different websites because the expense um, far, far um, out, well, it makes more sense to buy in bulk because you know that you sell two or three products from your site, you've already recouped that entire price. You're looking at a average pharmaceutical website selling um, uh, prescription-based medications. You're looking at 20 to 30K per month across the board. Uh, still the majority of that is erectile dysfunction medication, um, but 20 to 30K per website, and you have 100 websites, you're looking at a substantial profit there. So you don't actually care when law enforcement comes along and disrupts five or six of your websites. And we see this a lot. Um, agencies and enforcement um, groups will always publicize the website takedowns, the disruption of these networks that they have done. They will cite five, they will cite six. We've seen some recently in the, in the fraud space where, um, for example, seven websites were disrupted uh, for a particular um, pig butchering scam. But when you actually looked at it, they missed 27 other websites directly linked to that site. And those 27 websites were linked to another 871 websites. So in fact, all that actually happened is that uh, they took a very, very small percentage out of the game. And there's another 850 websites that, can sim that are simply still operating and um, business has not been disrupted at all. When we see enforcement action in, in Canada around cannabis from law enforcement, um, if you're monitoring the social media platforms and monitoring the social media intelligence gathered from these groups, they simply mention that they've had an issue with their website and please use our other one. And uh, so business has been disrupted for a maximum of an hour. Next slide, please. So um, from a disruption standpoint, this is how we can really start to, um, to make it a really bad day for these, for these groups. But this is where we do need the public-private relationships to really start happening. And this is where we, we will continue to, to struggle until such times we do. What you can see here on, um, on the screen is um, organic relationship profiling. So what we are doing here is actually building out the profile of the threat actors, the um, criminal groups, based upon their entire um, you know, virtual presence. So we are linking the sites that we know to, to sites that we don't know based upon you know, defined parameters and um, linked information. So then you can start to see the groups emerging. And through those groups, you start to see how they are talking and communicating with each other, but also how payments are being facilitated between the groups, but also how they are utilizing payment platforms, specific uh, registrars to register websites, um, this specific infrastructure to, to build this because they know of weaknesses or they know of, um, you know, in action in certain areas by either authorities or by the, the governing bodies themselves. So once you start building out these profiles, you start to understand how big the scope of the investigation is that maybe you're looking at. So it's not just a case of maybe one or 10 or 15 or 20 websites that you may have seen. It's actually a much larger problem. Next slide. 
So through this profiling, this is, this is where you start to identify the single points of failure for unconnected illicit websites. And again, I will state this works across the board for any illicit online economy, cigarettes, alcohol, drugs, um, and, and so on. What you can see in this um, chart here is the outlined circles are actually um, individual seemingly unconnected criminal networks. Uh, in this case, this is pharmaceuticals. They're all doing their own thing. Um, you're able within the environment uh, to make the links between the payment pages, the websites, uh, and their online presence. What you don't initially see from that, and, and the typical law enforcement or typical agency approach right now would be just to take down one of those circles. But as you can see from this um, visual, removing one of those circles actually has zero impact on the criminal uh, group itself. Uh, you can take down two or three and, and maybe that would be annoying, but it certainly doesn't impact this circle, larger circle, which you see in the middle, which is actually the criminal group's main infrastructure itself. So that's the essentially the command and control uh, for that for that group where um, it has nothing to do with the pharmaceutical markets, but they are communicating um, through uh, websites themselves. They actually have some uh, money laundering sites set up, which have got nothing to do with pharmaceuticals. They're actually using uh, freight and logistics uh, sites, for example, uh, which are very, very popular to uh, launder funds through. Uh, but in this example here, we can take down uh, those groups around the outside. Um, but there's a dark circle um, right in the middle of the screen where every single one of those criminal groups are using the same payment mechanism. That's a single point of failure right there. Uh, we can take down all these websites, but if we targeted that single point of failure and we had the right information, the right collaboration and cooperation from the you know, private sector and, and, and public bodies, this entire network would be disrupted. However, we need to change some of the thinking from law enforcement as well. Um, and, and speaking as an ex-law enforcement officer, we're 30, 40, 50 years behind the curve. Uh, when this information is provided to um, you know, law enforcement, and this has been done very, very recently, certainly here in Canada, for example, the response back is, well, we need to have a physical arrest. We need to have an indictment, which is, which you can understand that approach, but that approach is very, very 30, 40 years ago when you slapped some handcuffs on someone, put them in front of a judge and they were, they were charged. You can have a return on investment or a harm reduction figure associated with preventing this illicit network from targeting the citizens of your country. Uh, we did this in the UK many, many years ago where we could estimate um, how much money we had returned back to the UK economy by disrupting um, an illicit network or a bunch of illicit networks. And those numbers were in the you know triple millions, shall we say. Uh, but no one was ever arrested. Now, when you look at um, you know, some of these groups and how they operate, such as cartels and so on out of um, you know, South America and certainly some of the, the Russian and Chinese underground groups, I, I would always argue and slightly tongue in cheek that um, being arrested by Western law enforcement is a lot nicer than some of the repercussions they would suffer after their entire business model is disrupted or destroyed or dismantled, depending on your wording, um, by the same law enforcement agencies. Uh, so we need to change uh, the way that we approach this and maybe some of the agencies need to change their way of thinking from, it's nice to get the physical arrest and you can always still do that, but disrupting the entire business model um, is something which has a more significant um, and more impactful um, sort of presence. And uh, most of these markets can be very, very easily disrupted and dismantled if we had the, the support 
uh, um, from the from the private sector. I will hand it back over to you, David. Hey, thank you, Adrian. Thank you um, for really sharing the good, the bad, uh, the positive, the negatives uh, on efforts to counter the illicit trade, not only in illicit pharmaceuticals, but some of the other illicit markets, and really highlighting the utility and sophistication of, of, of today's criminals, not only across hubs, but across the digital world and why uh, we need to uh, deal with this outdated model approach to, to countering these threats um, and better organize ourselves. I will pose the question, but let me first bring in uh, Dr. Leila Hashemi into the conversation who can also share more about her NSF uh, research and continue our discussion. Uh, Leila is researcher and data analyst at Track, foc focusing on international supply chain, cybercrime, corruption, and illicit trade. Um, she's analyzed the supply chains of counterfeit PPE, fentanyl, pharmaceuticals as part of, of her research. Um, but as, as Leila leads the discussion, I would like the panelists to think uh, how um, partners are working within their industry to share information across industry the ways to better coordinate um, collective efforts with governments to overcome the lack of political will and some of the issues of both Monica, Adrian, and frankly, um, Jerry also highlighted. Um, over to you, Leila. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to all of our speakers for highlighting what illicit trade looks like across sectors and sharing their really important insights, such as how there are often blurred trade boundaries between illicit and illicit in global economies with, illicit, with international supply chains. Um, our subject matter experts also emphasize the very negative impacts counterfeits and other illicit trade has on our economy, our health and our security. And finally, as this event really aims to highlight, we really need a whole of society approach that includes collaboration across sectors. This is something we're very actively working on at TRAC, as Dr. Shelley mentioned at the start, with our projects, including our impactful public-private partnerships with 3M and Amazon. So I see that we have lots of questions in the chat. I'll pose a couple of questions to our speakers. And again, I encourage our participants to pose their questions in the chat for our speakers as well. So. Um, I'm gonna start with some audience questions before I go a little bit broader. I think our first one that we had was from Axel Hein to Adrian. Could you recommend any commercial solution to monitor wallets and payments, or is this your own solution we see in the graph? Uh, so there are multiple solutions um, out there to, to, to monitor wallets. Um, I can certainly provide um, the the group with with some later on um, materials being provided uh, a lot of it is open source um, the, the processes that I showed you on screen are simply just a collaboration of the best processes put to built built into a mechanism or built into a model um, to actually then trace those but um, uh, I'll, I'll rather than go through a whole list of uh, which ones the best ones I will simply I'll provide a list uh, of the ones that uh, certainly I've used in the past Okay, and kind of related to that, another question was, has this information been used to train law enforcement on this? <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, so yes, um, during my law enforcement career, um, I was actually one of the people who was training other law enforcement agencies globally to do similar um, operations. Um, unfortunately, now, um, because there is more focus, uh, I would say, on, uh, again, returns of investments and spending of money and resourcing is always an issue uh, and expertise. Um, I'd say that uh, this methodology has sort of fallen by the wayside to revert back to the, to the tried, and trusted, tried and trusted and the knowns. The knowns of going out and getting a warrant, going out and spending time in front of a judge, spending six months to try and take a website down when in fact you can actually take a website down in less than 24 hours. So it's it's um, it's certainly something that would need to be uh, sort of reinvigorated. Um, but yes, it's certainly not something that is commonly used anymore, unfortunately. Something that maybe should be used and we can use your help <laughs> implementing, Adrian, thank you. 
Uh, we have a question for Monica from um, Brayden. How does worldview, specifically religious beliefs and cultural norms, impact or change solutions for illicit alcohol trade in countries where prohibition is present? Thank you. Thank you, Leila. Thank you for the question. Um, I think this is a very important topic because uh, we do have to uh, consider, uh, you know, the, the, the local reality. Uh, but what happens in practice, so we have a difference of, uh, you know, the theory and the practice. Uh, a good example is India, where we, saw, where we see that there are some dry states, uh, meaning that the alcohol is illicit to produce and to, to, to consume. But what we see is that in practice, what happens is that the neighboring states are taking advantage of these uh, of these uh, total prohibition in the state where the prohibition is in place and they supply uh, all the products. So it is a black market, uh, which is which uh, in practice is, is, is still, you know, very vital. And uh, the only problem is that, of course, 100 percent is illicit. And of course, there's uh, 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 an important pool of value that the state is losing. And then the other states are taking advantage of, uh, or you know, not just the, the pool of value uh, on, from the fiscal point of view, but job generation. You know, the whole value chain of of, of this industry. So, so another example is I don't know if you if you remember at the football World Cup uh, in Qatar. Um, it's a country where alcohol is fully regulated, and of course, uh, a couple of days before the starting of the of the World Cup. Uh, we were banned to uh, sell uh, beer that had alcohol uh, near the venues. Uh, of course, uh, we saw an important increase of illicit trade of, of many beverages. Uh, we were able to sell um, a lot of, uh, which I think it was uh, really interesting, the exercise that we did. Uh, we replaced uh, uh, alcoholic uh, beer with non-alcoholic beer, so but, but zero, et cetera. But that's another story. But uh, in practice, what's happened is that this prohibition enabled, uh, you know, uh, an important um, uh, incoming uh, amounts of 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 uh, of uh, illicit stuff. So so you know we have to uh, put in a balance uh, reality with uh, with the ideal world. Uh, even if religion doesn't permit, uh, in this case, alcohol, in reality is that the market is demanding it, and we have to have. You know, find the sweet spot to 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 of course respect uh, cultural traditions and uh, and and the society where the uh, you know the, of the state that we're talking about in the case of India, for example. But at the same time, uh, reality takes uh, over. You know, and 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 we see these things happening. Most of the cases of uh, of these uh, when we see these uh, um, mass um, uh, deaths uh, because of intoxications of counterfeited alcohol happen in, in states that are dry. That's another case. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, so to bring it a little bit broader and because this is the aim of this event, I wondered, um, maybe we'll start with Jerry with if you could give examples of multi-sector collaboration and joint initiatives, including public-private partnerships that we've seen, hopefully successful cases. Yeah, so probably one of the first ones uh, goes back down in Miami, and it was the bis the BAS, the Business Against Smuggling Coalition, which was a very successful public-private partnership that focused heavily on Central America and the Caribbean on targeting illicit uh, products from coming into the USA. It was very successful. Um, it it actually got a lot of of private companies involved to work closely with U.S. Customs and ATF and others to cross-share, cross-pollinate, not only in the apparel industry, but across pretty much the whole industry, agriculture coming in uh, into the Port of Miami, move that forward. And it was the creation of the CTPAT program, which uh, ultimately became very successful volunteer program it's kind of morphed um, into something beyond that, but it was a an all voluntary effort to work across every sector. Uh, we were one of the original six, and if you look at the six companies, it was you know General Motors, it was uh, Target, it was Haynes Brands that was there, BP. So clearly a very um, wide sectoral, and then. Over time, each industry sector bored down into their own unique challenges. 
And, and then if you flip that from there inside Central America, like inside the Dominican Republic, inside El Salvador, there are similar breakoff groups that work collaboratively inside like the apparel sector very closely in partnership with law enforcement, ocean carriers, transportation to really share, you know, what's what's legitimate freight moving and what's not. So I, I think there's a lot of those, but I think you have to be very careful um, in the U.S. because you run into to a little bit of antitrust issues about when an industry gets together and starts sharing information. Um, and the other is the, the integrity of the law enforcement agencies that come together um, are very important. And I think you saw, you know, the last one is the implementation of the Lacey Act. There are a lot of combined efforts to try to stop illegal logging and, and deforestation, but it, it also has to take the hysterical out of the room and really go after the, the facts. And, and validating those facts are important. And, you know, Adrian and Monica gave some great examples of the importance of facts that, and that both sides or all sides see the facts for what they are. Thank you so much, Jerry. And before I go on to um, Aiden and Monica, I just wanted to remind you, you can also use the raise hand function if you'd like to ask your question verbally. Um, Monica, did you wanna speak to the public-private partnerships? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm thinking about a case in Peru, for example, where uh, you know the the um, municipality of Lima got together with our company. Um, the, the 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 company's name in in operation in Peru is uh, Bacus, and we got together into a um, multi-factor uh, solution. So we we worked in um, in communications and we worked in. Uh, in conveying the messages of raising awareness of the importance of illicit trade and, and the dangers of, of the products that are in the market. The other one is, is trying to formalize, uh, you know, the, 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 the products or, or you know, the, the businesses that were um, informal. And, and the other one was uh, to um, work on the value chain, the ethanol value chain. So setting up a very uh, easy to follow regulation regarding ethanol control, denaturing the ethanol that is not run for human consumption. So it was like a, a list of five or six very simple things. We met, we met every uh, month, we got together and we say, okay, who's doing what, how we can improve the regulation, improve enforcement, uh, raise level of awareness, etc. After After two or three years of working, the level of illicit alcohol was reduced in 4%. So it was it was around 29, uh, you know, and, and it ended up 25, of course, that was before COVID. Uh, but I am convinced that, uh, that having a good baseline, uh, working with the government, uh, is not even, you know, and, and trying to, in some cases, involve technology as well. And in some cases, involving the legal place of the market, providing information to the governments, that is super important. And then working together, I think it is not the way uh, or an alternative. I think it is the only way we can all combat illicit trade. And I think the big learning that we've had all, after all these years of working is that we as private companies cannot do anything by ourselves. The government is very, very difficult to act uh, in isolation. Uh, everybody has to contribute. And, uh, and of course, private sector plays an important role, but uh, we cannot do anything by ourselves and the government cannot do act uh, you know, in isolation, that's impossible. Thanks so much for highlighting that uh, cross-sector collaboration and how it can have such impact. Um, Adrian? Yeah, I mean, just to echo what everyone else has said, I mean, I already mentioned Pangea um, as, as a really global collaboration, although that was mostly law enforcement with some, uh, some government agencies involved in that as well. Um, but we, we did operations in the UK right at the very beginning, uh, going back a long time now, uh, where we had 94, 94 different brands across the board. So full demographic from apparel to pharmaceutical to cigarettes, alcohol, and so on, on board where we were simply providing them with the data to show them what their footprint in the illicit market looked like. 
and then providing them with the facility to to really disrupt that illicit market from from their perspective. I mean, essentially brand protection work, if you want to look at it in in today's sort of parlance. Um, but that was really a public sector, you know, law enforcement collaboration. And then um, you know, in in the in the US, we certainly had that whole um, working within the pharmaceutical sector and in the um, banking finance sectors as well. And for the first time, really being able to, although still working in a silo, but operating as the central pivot point between you know, the financial institutions and the you know, government and you know, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry, being able to combine all, the, all that data from their various different silos, because they won't talk to each other, but they'll talk to a central entity and then provide them with an overall view of disruption, what you can do, handing nice little packages over to DEA and so on, um, was, was hugely impactful. Uh, and this was outside of everything else that was done at the time. Uh, and I know a lot of that work still continues now, but you know, it does work, but trust, uh, as mentioned, is a, is a huge, huge issue. Yeah, thank you so much for highlighting that um, importance of data sharing and, and trust in that um, information sharing um, initiatives. So we actually, um, I'm going to pivot to a question from the chat from Christian that asks, do any of you have insights on illicit trade as a result of Russian invasion of Ukraine? How is this showing up in the cyber world? So that's open to whom that would like to answer. Uh, well, I, uh, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so uh, much like much like COVID, the the actual uh, Russian incursion into Ukraine didn't have a significant impact, as far as I've been able to see, on the illicit marketplaces. But what it has uh, created is new trade routes, where established trade routes, for example, uh, opium out of Afghanistan, would traditionally go through uh, Ukraine or immediately surrounding uh, countries. They've now had to pivot those trade routes to try and avoid, you know, certainly a lot of the Black Sea ports, for example, are now off limits. So they've now had to pivot those trade routes um, and you know, move further south. They're using a lot more of the Mediterranean um, ports. Uh, certainly Greece and Turkey are now seeing a lot more traffic going through um, their borders than they previously did prior to, um, prior to the invasion. But again, this is just another example of how quickly the criminal groups are able to, to, to pivot. Um, and certainly I'll, I'll just quickly mention COVID was another huge impact um, on the trade routes. Uh, a lot of the fentanyl-based production facilities were actually out of Wuhan. Uh, and obviously that shut down very, very quickly. So the South American cartels were suddenly scrabbling a lot to reproduce um, you know, the, the fentanyl-based precursor ingredients, which they were traditionally getting through over via the shipping routes out of the Chinese, um, uh, Chinese Republic. But at the time, Russia stepped in and sort of provided that uh, a stopgap, as it would, through their established trade routes uh, for the fentanyl products in, into, into Europe and then Europe into sort of America and South America. So, um, like I said, not seeing a lot of impact directly. However, the trade routes have significantly shifted because of the conflict. Um, can I ask you to follow up on that, Adrian? And are you seeing a cyber imprint that has changed? Because there's so many Russian techies who've left and don't have employment and may be displaced and may be providing illicit services. So a lot of the illicit services uh, from the Russian speakers were often Ukrainians uh, to, to begin with. Um, the the Russian-based um, cyber criminals were actually utilizing um, code programmers and so on from Brazil. Uh, Brazil was a major hub for producing um, programmers for the Russian market, but uh, the actual Ukrainian Russian speakers, they have been somewhat displaced. However, because of the nature of the business that we are in, in terms of cyber, you can work from anywhere. So um, what we've seen is that they may have moved uh, allegiances, but certainly the skill sets have just been utilized by a, by a new group or an established group that has simply just recruited people in and increased their, their you know, footprint in this marketplace. So the only impact really is around 
the Russian market itself, uh, where we have seen that uh, a lot of the, let's say, illicit criminal enterprises have been sort of gathered back in to protect the Russian infrastructure from outside attacks rather than focusing on new business opportunities elsewhere. Yeah, thank you so much for highlighting that. I think um, we very much are seeing the incredible adaptability of criminal actors during moments of crisis. So COVID, Ukraine, any of these that kind of capitalizing on the chaos that happens during these moments. Um, if Monica or Jerry don't have anything to add to that one, I'm gonna go into our- I, I have one to just to add to it. I think the, there's two things. One is you're seeing a lot of state actors that are participating in illicit trade. Um, you know, clearly countries like India, the, the buying of oil, um, you know, it's open, it, not just hiding it, but the open purchasing, the same thing in parts of Asia. So there, you know, in the past, you could argue shame kept people from doing certain things that those, those guardrails are gone. Um, and so you see very open, you know, heads of state leadership of a country engaging in and things that are market prevented and they're doing it anyway. The other is uh, that I would argue is there is a massive fatigue issue now just about illicit trade at all. Um, you know, you, the US is very distracted. You can make a lot of arguments. Canada is very distracted, but there's a fatigue and kind of a sense of it's here to stay. And that's the worst sensation to have in this type of problem is to accept uh, that that it's here to stay and it's over there it's not here you know it's it's in my neighbor's yard it's not in my yard that's not how you win the battle and i i think we have to really ask the question lastly to the you know major institutions all the way to the un you know, there is a level of almost indifference that has reached throughout a lot of the international organizations that has accepted a degree of tolerance or a degree, there's a level that it can coexist. And in the past, there's been a no tolerance for it, even while it flourished. And I, I think people need to be very concerned about that. And you're seeing the impact of that, because look at the levels of human trafficking uh, that are going on uh, now around Russia, inside Russia, uh, the movement of citizens out of Ukraine by Russians, what's going on in the southern border, what, the number of people who are crossing oceans to move around uh, North Africa. These are staggering events, and and if you and if it's happening to people. You can only imagine what else is happening to product. I mean, we just witnessed just south of the border, United States and Mexico, four people down on medical tourism. Two are now dead, one's injured, and the other one, uh, you know, so they've rescued the four, but two died and, and one's injured. And uh, this, this is happening, you know, so frequently that we're becoming numb to it. And uh, this is not okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Jerry, for highlighting the state involvement, the corruption, this um, bring up this idea of fatigue of illicit trade in general and the need for international cooperation to address the issue. So I would like to pose to each of our speakers in one minute or less, if you could please give us some suggestions that you would make to policymakers on strengthening the fight against illicit trade. One minute or less, who would like to go first? Yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, go ahead. Go, 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 okay. go ahead. Um, so, I mean, for policymakers, and this is a long term um, fight, certainly within the US and, and probably globally as well, is that we need to bring the policy up to date for a start uh, and make it applicable to what's happening in 2023 rather than 1983. Um, and we need to start holding you know, some of the facilitators directly accountable. Um, you know, Section 230, for example, the prime is, is a really good example of, of that um, in the US. Uh, once we can bring accountability on board, this goes across social media as well, um, 
we will, I strongly believe that we will start to see some affirmative and positive action because right now it's best effort and best effort is a, is a tick box, check box exercise, uh, nothing more. Um, so that would be one of the, one of my major discussion points. Thanks so much, Adrian. Monica? Yeah, and I think what Adrian just mentioned, it applies to all the industries, you know, update regulation, update ways of enforcement, use of technology. We can leverage on technology in, in many cases, in others, not a lot. But I do think that, uh, that sometimes there is a disconnection in timing and in access to technology for enforcement. So that's one. The other one, which is really important, is social norms. Uh, so uh, the role of so the, that social norms play in, in, in controlling illicit trade, it's, it's how society and how the, how the social norms of society evolve, uh, you know, in time. And, and we've seen in the case of, uh, for example, of illicit alcohol, uh, some years back, it was perfectly uh, uh, acceptable. Actually, it was embarrassing to pay custom taxes. Are you stupid? Are you? Let's buy something uh, which is a smuggle so you don't have to pay taxes. So that was the social norm 30, 40 years ago. So now it is unacceptable to buy, uh, you know, something that is not uh, the real McCoy, something that is, uh, you know, software that is that is uh, uh, illicit, etc. So, so I do think that this is long term, but the role of, of of the changing social norms and how the society evolves, uh, it's an important role that uh, that the government has to be an actor, not just a sole actor, but it has to has to uh, you know provide input and and work with the private sector. So that's another one. In addition to what uh, you know, I already mentioned before. Lovely. Thanks so much, Monica and Jerry. Before I pass it off to you, Judy. Sure. The, I'd, I'd say a couple of ways. One is elected leaders need to walk walk the talk. And they need to be intolerant of it. The second is we need to very personalize the issue so that you, you just put a stake in the ground, not here, not my house, not my family, not my community, and localize the, the resistance back, that we're just not going to have it. Uh, Monica made a good point. I'm, I'm not going to let my friend buy some counterfeit or do drugs. I'm, it's just not going to happen and dig in. And then the third is create a concept of ownership that you own your life. It is your life to live free. And the value of that freedom is paramount above all things and, and just defend it. And, you know, Habitat did that with housing. We, we should be doing that with illicit, that this is my life, my family, my neighborhood, my community. Nobody's going to take it from us, and we're going to band together to, to hold on to it. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our speakers, and thank you for all, to all of you for joining us. I'll pass it off to Judy Dean, our Deputy Director at TRAC, to close us out. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our three speakers, to our great moderators, and also to you all, the audience. It's been a great discussion and very interesting to us all. I just want to end with a few words about our project. Our We call it the HIT project, the Hubs of Illicit Trade, which is a research project that is sponsoring this event. Um, it is involves a global team of researchers. As David mentioned, we're looking specifically at four hubs of illicit trade, Dubai, transporter area, in uh, South America, Central America, and Eastern Europe. And we're working on in-depth reports for each of these hubs, and then a more concentrated final report of key findings and impacts, local, regional, and global. And in today's discussion, we're moving to a second phase of this project, which is the solutions. What can be done about these hubs, and what should our priorities be? And that is why for this, which is our, the third of our events in this project, we asked um, leading speakers from the private sector to give us their insights and their experiences and their suggestions and priorities. Um, in this second stage, we're planning to develop a white paper of policy recommendations. And we're also planning a conference in September with the World Customs Organization and also some other events and, and discussions. So if you're interested in this subject, please stay on our mailing list and we'll let you know about further events and send you the documents when they're completed. And once again, thank you to all and have a great day.